Coming up on this episode of Scrolling Around, we sit down with Superintendent Tim Throne to talk about added on days. And then we visit Captain Stapp of the Oxford Fire Department to learn about ice safety. And we finally end with going to the elementary school PTO Glow Dance. So stick around for Schooling Around. I'm Alexis Ware. And I'm Danielle Smith. And it has certainly been a minute since we've been here. It has with all of the back-to-back -back snow days. I know the students aren't worrying about it at all. Right. And we are here for the first time recording in our new studio. OCTV went ahead and moved this past week. We still have a little fine tweaking to do, but we're all oh, very yeah. excited to be here. Yep. So we are now located um, at Seymour Lake right in the front next to it's the community center, the parks and recreation offices as well. Yes. So a lot of fun things in store, especially when the weather gets a little bit warmer. Going into the rundown for this episode, we're going to jump right into the interview with Superintendent Tim Throne about upcoming events as far as ACT testing, um, SA, SAT testing, mm -hmm. as well as added on days on the end of the school year. Take a look. It is really just guidance on when we feel we should close school. There can be numerous incidences that can cause us to call school off obviously weather being one of them so it could be snow could be ice could be rain could be we don't have power in a building we don't have water we don't have heat numerous conditions so there's not really a policy when we go to uh, call, call school off let's just talk about weather to begin with Obviously, the, the biggest thing is just uh, safety of our students. So there is two or three people that go out in the morning, real early in the morning, and um, look at roads. We, we check all sections of the district, north, south, east, and west. And um, there's usually a few main roads that are our trickiest for our buses that we tend to um, make sure we check, although we'll also spot check other ones. We also spot check our parking lots, driveways, all those types of things. And how does the individual district closing affect the state of emergency closings? So the two are not related. So last week when the governor called a state of emergency, I believe it was on Wednesday and Thursday, there's nothing that we are required, as far as I know, by law that we had to close. Obviously with the wind chills where they were at, uh, we ended up closing school. But the actual state of emergency does not require us to call school off. And how many days off for times of emergency like snow or heavy rain do the students get off a year? So into our calendar we have built six days. Anything over six days we have to make up. There's currently both a day requirement and an hour requirement that our students have to attend school. So both number of days and number of hours. Um, once you go over six you can petition to the state to get, I think, up to three waived. All right? So currently, right now, Oxford has missed seven days of school. So we will be petitioning the state to get back some days. If we only close school two or less days for the remainder of the year, we're good to go. We'll submit our waiver. I think there's a good chance we'll get the waiver and so 
we don't need uh, to do anything. Let's say that we end up calling school three more days this year. At that point, we're at 10 days. Uh, we only can get up to nine waived. So six built in, three waived, total of nine. That additional day, we would have to make up both in minutes and actual day. So um, you used to be able to maybe say, we'll add so many minutes to the end of a school day and you can make up that time. Well, you can for the hours portion, but for the, you also have to make up the actual day portion. So we would have to find another day. What's a little bit unique this year is that um, we have a ton of uh, massive upgrades to our facilities this summer. So we are already have scheduled days where um, literally it's the last day for students, last day for teachers. We have a couple of professional development days and then we have contractors already scheduled to come in and do demo work. We have to maximize the amount of time uh, this summer, the summer of 2019 here, between the last day of school and the first day in the fall because we're adding air conditioning and we're doing just a lot of facility upgrades, right? So um, I just, I say all that to say uh, we, we don't really want to mess with changing the um, already scheduled last day of school if we can help it. Now touching on that demo work again, are all schools in district getting some extra things added on this summer or just a few of them? Pretty much every building will be touched except the middle school. So a lot of our summer programming that we traditionally have like at the high school or at OES or OELC, uh, our plans are right now to move that programming over to the middle school. Now besides the renovations to the buildings, what else is to come for the rest of the school year and even in the summer? Um, I don't know as if we are uh, planning any uh, major renovations or upgrades or that kind of stuff during the actual remainder of the school year. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think pretty much all those are, are planned once, once school gets out. Any new changes in the curriculum for any of the schools? We have a lot of updates to our curriculum that are coming uh, through the process. Uh, they have, it has not been presented to the board yet, but I think, um, I think you can verify with Mr. Weaver maybe the exact grades and content areas that, um, that will be updated by the end of the year. All right. And a big talking point every single year at the end is ACT and um, SAT, ACT and SAT testing. Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, right when we get back from spring break, we have uh, all of our mandated state testing. So MSTEP in the lower grades, PSAT uh, in I think it's 8th, 9th, and 10th grade, and then SAT in 11th grade. Hugely important for our students to do well. Not only is it a reflection upon their building, uh, upon the district, uh, it's a big reflection upon themselves, right? And so, um, whether we like it or not, the better that SAT score, the, um, the more money that student has, an opportunity for scholarships and grants, and the better universities and colleges that they can um, be accepted in. So, um, while testing isn't everything, it is still a major component of how well we do. And is OHS doing anything that you know of in prep of the ACT and mixing these up? That's the okay. ACT and SAT testing. <laughs> is the high school doing anything special? That'd be a great question for Mr. Wolf. I'm sure that they. Um, 
Most of our schools always plan something um, in preparation for the required state test. Um, there's special days, you know, some days they're only juniors show up and that kind of stuff. I think, um, I think our food service department and Mrs. Bissett, I think they sometimes they do something special with like breakfast or, or that kind of thing. But um, yeah, you probably should check with them just, uh, just to verify. Unless it's anything else that you want to touch on. I think I would just remind people we, we don't take uh, closing school lightly. Uh, myself and everybody else here at our central offices, we do work on, on snow days. And so I always get that asked that question, oh, how, how, do you, how do you like being able to give yourself a day off? Well, it doesn't quite work that way. Uh, we all work here. Our days start out early, um, and I get phone calls and emails from parents whether we close school off or we don't close school off. We get that um, not everybody has access to uh, child care when school's not in session. Not everybody has family members that live close by, and so. Is it a hardship when we close school for some families? It is. At the same time, we also don't want to be putting our students in a position where it's not safe to attend school, whether it's wind chills or icy roads or whatever the case may be. And so I guess I just, I want people to know, we don't take it lightly. Um, we make the best decision with the best data that we have at the time and that's how we do it. It's interesting to get the administrative aspect of how they determine whether to close school or not. And even more interesting, Superintendent Simthrone did say that, because we've had a lot of snow days, that you we know, have. back to back, it, like you said, it seems like the students have been out more this month than they have been in school. Or even the whole year for that exactly, matter. Exactly, since 2019 even started. So because of that, everyone knows across the board, not just in Oxford, but every school has a certain amount of, I guess you would call them uh, absent days or snow days that they're allowed to have. After they exceed that limit, then you do have to start to tack on extra days and hours as uh, Superintendent Tim Throne said, it's not just the days, um, onto the end of the school year. So you won't get out, what is it, uh, June? Mid-June, mid -June? typically. So because of that, because of the state-issued emergency closings, they can submit certain forms and requests to the state to try to get some of them taken off so that they don't have to add to the end of the school year. Now, is this only because the governor issued a statewide emergency, or is that something each district can do uh, regardless? So from what I gathered from the interview was that it's something that the district can do regardless. It doesn't mean because they submit it that it's going to get approved. Mm -hmm. So it's always that possibility that there is still going to be days added. However, because it was state issued in the interview you did here, Tim Throne say that it's likely that state most likely will decide to go ahead and leave the end of the school year where it is. But just because it's a statewide or state issued mm -hmm. emergency does not mean that the district has to close. That and we're only in mid-February mm -hmm. so winter is not over yet. We could yeah. even have more days where uh, students will be staying home yet another day from school um, which leads us to the importance of all winter safety and ice safety in particular. Living where we do in Michigan, there are so many lakes in the area and we are just at that sweet spot where lakes aren't always all the way frozen as if they were when we go a little further north on 75. So it's always so important to be careful when you're snowmobiling, going ice fishing, and that's why we went ahead and met with Captain Stapp of the Oxford Fire Department so we could learn, learn a little bit more on how to be safe during this winter. Take a look. Hello everyone, we're here at Stony Lake with Captain Stapp here. We're going to discuss some ice safety and some things to do if your car or if you're out ice fishing and the ice isn't as thick as you thought it was. So first things first, how thick should ice be before people go out on it? 
So there's a there's recommended levels that you can get as far as inches, mm -hmm. but the DNR doesn't recommend going off of that because there's a lot of different variables. Okay. So they'll you can see online it will say four inches for a person. Right. But water on top of the ice or snow, uh, there can be springs, there can be a warm day that can weaken the ice. So it's better to kind of check as you're going to make sure it's safe. Okay. And how can people check as they're going? So the, the ice that will be the strongest is going to be like clear that you can see okay. through. Stuff that we're seeing out today mm -hmm. where it's cloudy, that's a little weaker ice. The okay. snow is kind of melted and then frozen in there. So that's things that you can look for. As far as checking when you're going out, just taking like an ice spud and Ooh. kind of kind of sounding the ice and seeing if it breaks as you're walking out is a good way to do it. Okay, so what we were seeing a few days ago with the polar vertex, where it was kind of cloudy on top and it was a bunch of snow covering it, that's something that you advise not to go on. That'll just be more weight on the ice and okay. so it can weaken the ice. So water and snow on top of it is more weight and it won't hold as much. Okay, now what is something that people can do, say they're driving, it's a little bit of a dark night and they accidentally drift off into the river or a lake what can they do so as far as if your if your car is sinking mm -hmm. uh, there are some videos to watch I'm not really too too keen on the expertise on how to get how to get out of that but I think as far as just getting yourself out of the vehicle as fast as you can would probably okay. be the most beneficial thing for you to do mm -hmm. Now it's starting to rain a little bit, so how does that affect ice? Does it affect it at all? It'll just be more weight on top of the ice, okay. and then if it's not freezing, you know, it's raining, so it's not freezing cold, so the ice will melt with that water on top of it. Okay. Now, recently, I was actually at the Board of Education office, and one of the secretaries were tell was telling me that this past Friday, that was the polar vertex, and it was extremely cold, but because we had that weather period where it was really cold, and then it wasn't as cold, like today, for instance, that affects the ice, so maybe people shouldn't go out on it. If the ice will be weaker. Okay. I just won't be as strong of an ice. Okay. Now, ice fishing, is that the same as maybe drifting off on the ice a little bit? As far as people taking their vehicles out on the ice? Mm -hmm. So that's something the DNR really advises against. Okay. And I would advise against it as well. Um, you just, it's a lot of weight to put on the ice. So it would be best just to kind of stay off the ice. And if no you're matter gonna, what. If you're going to go out and ice fish, just walk out to your site that you're going to do that at. Okay. So definitely no snowmobiles or anything like that? They, you can snowmobile on the ice. Mm -hmm. There's just a risk involved with that. All the time. Yes. Okay. So I think the thing to remember is there's no such thing as safe ice. Mm -hmm. There always can be a danger behind it. And so you just have to kind of use common sense. Okay. Now in an ice rescue, what are some things that the fire department brings to help them with that? So the fire department has uh, suits, Gumby suits that are cold water suits that they'll wear. Um, they'll have rescue lines to get out to the person. Mm -hmm. uh, we also have a dive team. So if the person does submerge, we can actually uh, do a, a ice under under the water rescue as well okay and those are kind of the big tools that we'll use for that is every partner or I guess firefighter on the team able to get into the water can everyone swim they're all certified in ice rescue okay. you really don't need to swim because the you know the actual suits you're wearing are so buoyant huh. so it's it's you're floating you're just kind of pushing your way out there a certain number are certified in ice rescue with the diving aspect and is it a certain number that people should call or have stored in their phones for that special department it's 911 okay. and then if there's any type of emergency that we get dispatched to and we need extra resources, we can call for those resources. And what other winter safety can you advise for the viewers? So if you do find yourself falling through the ice, the most important thing to do is stay calm. Try to remove any extra clothes that you have. Snowmobile suits are going to add weight and will pull you down. Uh, struggling and panicking is going to get you tired and that will cause you to go under. Uh, always remember that the area that you came from has the strongest ice, so that's the way that you want to go back. So if you can't pull yourself up onto the ice, you want to just kind of get to the edge and stay calm and try to conserve your energy so you can keep yourself above the ice. Um, the fire department usually responds in three minutes, so it's a pretty quick response time. Uh, it's important that we know where you are, so if you're going out on the ice, let somebody know um, so that you know if you don't come home, we can kind of have an idea where you're at. Awesome, all right, well thank you. You're welcome. 
Captain Step made some amazing points, mm -hmm. one of the most common, even if you're not going to ice fish or play on the ice at all. In the winter, you should always dress warm. That means layer up, put on mm -hmm. socks, undershirts, and things like that. Um, besides dressing warm, obviously, the snow and rain does affect conditions of the ice. That's so right. So if it's a little bit snowy, you may not want to get on the ice that day or be extra cautious when doing so. And I think it's so important, the biggest takeaway from that interview with Captain Stapp is to remember that no ice is considered safe ice. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of the tools you use to measure it or if, you know, your snowmobiles out there, yes, those are heavy machinery mm -hmm. and... Um, you know, it, it can support that amount of weight, but still at the same time, those weather conditions that you had previously, like the rain and the extra snow, just adds more weight and the ice isn't as sturdy as it once was. Exactly, especially if the winter kind of changes like it does here in Michigan. Very it's often. Warm one day and then cold the next. You just want to be extra careful because it does affect how the ice forms. Mm -hmm. And just because you see ice on top doesn't mean it's ice on the bottom. Going back right. to the response time, the or Captain Step did say that the usually mm -hmm. the most or the safest place to kind of escape the ice or escape danger, say your snowmobile or whatever it is, goes through. Did go through. Mm -hmm. Always go back to the same spot that you originally went on the ice on. Right, it'll be the sturdiest ice. Exactly. And the response time, I was floored to find out that it's only about three minutes for mm -hmm. Oxford. So very quick. So, and you know, he really emphasized staying calm, going back to that more sturdy mm -hmm. ice and having someone there to call 911 or making sure someone knows exactly where you are. So before you go out and ice skate, play hockey, snowmobile, what have you, make sure you tell someone where you're going. Exactly. Just don't go alone. <laughs> right. And speaking of not going alone, after this, we head we headed over to OES mm -hmm. for their PTO glow dance. Take a look. excited to dance. I love dancing too. Yeah, I'm very excited because it's all glowing. And yes, I love glowing, so I love being weird. And I also love having stickers on my face, so I put a sticker on my face. Same. <laughs> um, I'm going to play games with my family. Who are you with? Uh, my mom, my brother, and Andrew. And my brother's really nice and yeah. Um, run around. Yeah. Dance. Probably just dance. Run around and dance. I want to dance. I wanna dance. Um. because it's all glowing. Go and have fun. We thank our 
PTO for putting this on. That dance was the cutest, most adorable thing I've ever seen. That's a dance I would still want to go to. Exactly. It looks so fun. <laughs> Now, who exactly are involved in the PTO Glow Dances? So the PTO is the parent-teacher organization, and the one specifically for Daniel Axford and Oxford Elementary Schools mm -hmm. is a federally recognized 501c3 nonprofit. And if you're a parent or a guardian of a student that goes to one of those schools, you're automatically a part of the PTO. Mm -hmm. So, surprise. <laughs> um, but being a part of the PTO, or at least going to the meetings, it's open to you whether you're on the board or not, where you get to um, you know, get in-person updates with the principal and with teacher representatives, share ideas about activities your kids participate in, and most importantly, you get to vote on how these funds that are raised, like from the Glow Dance, mm -hmm. is used to benefit your child and the schools that they attend. And not just ending at the PTOs, and Speaking of, is that just for DA and OES or? Well, each school has their own individual PTO. Okay. Aside from DA and OES, there is our combined because those students that go to Daniel Axford will eventually go to Oxford Elementary School to right. finish out their third through fifth grade years. Okay. But what I really liked about uh, learning more about their particular PTO program is that they have it all readily available for you on the Oxford School's website oh. page if you Google their PTO. And they have their mission state labeled too, which is to support and promote a school experience that is educational, secure, and fun for students, mm -hmm. their families, and the staff of Daniel Axford and Oxford Elementary Schools to enhance the educational facilities, opportunities, and materials for students of DA and OES, and to promote the welfare of DA and OES children and their families at home. So they do wow. a lot for those students. It's not just, um, you know, being room moms or, you know, helpers or room dads, what have you. They're the ones behind the scenes putting on these fun events for these students, like the glow dance exactly. or fairs that your children's school may have annually. They're the ones that do all of this. And again, it's open to everyone, even if you're not on the PTO board. Mm -hmm. So if you want to know a little bit more what's going on in your child's school, go ahead and reach out to their schools and their PTOs. It looks like that most PTOs have a meeting about once a month. Okay. So just get in contact and find out when the next one is so you can go ahead and be involved and get your voice heard. Wow, that's amazing. And also, if you want to be involved in the schools at a, a bigger level, you can join the, or not join, but just participate mm -hmm. and go and be involved in the school board meetings. Those are hosted fairly, fairly regularly, mm -hmm. at least once a month. I believe they're a little bit more regular. If you would like to find out more information about that, go on to OxfordSchools.com or .org. .org. <laughs> And it has all the information there for you to look at. Everyone is welcome. Doesn't matter who you are, as long as you have a student or just want to be involved, a parent, relative, or someone like right. that. Right. So it's not even any community member that lives within Oxford can go and attend exactly. these meetings. Yep. So it's not like you know you have to be a parent of someone who is in elementary school or in high school. Everyone is welcomed. Mm -hmm. And a good thing is that you can also bring your child with you as well. You don't have to leave them at home just so they have a little bit more knowledge of what's going on in their district as a whole as well. Um, and you know what, that about wraps up this episode of Schooling Around. Stay tuned for more information and just a lot of fun energy in our next episode. Until next time, I'm Alexis Ware. And I'm Danielle Smith. We'll see you next time. We here at OCTV cover the local events and government meetings of Oxford, Addison, and Leonard. We also produce and edit programs for you viewers out there. With the leadership of our station manager, Bill Service, we have been a very successful team winning awards from the state of Michigan for best electronic media, giving attention to our local veterans. We also won awards for excellence in directing and educational programs. With the help of our great new equipment and our technical directors, we write, produce, and broadcast our local news for you. Without our production manager, Terry Stiles, our channel and station wouldn't be the well-oiled machine it is today. She coordinates the editing assignments and shoot schedule with our editors and camera people. OCTV and its communities make a great team.
Thank you.